Hey everyone, welcome to Family Church's YouTube channel. We are so excited that you are here. Make sure to like and comment on this message as well as subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay updated and connected with us. We are in week one of our new series, Hero, and we hope this message encourages you and impacts your life. Amen. Thank you again so much for worshiping with us this morning. We are in week one of a brand new series called Hero. I need a hero. I'm sorry, you had to endure that, but you're also welcome if you enjoyed it. Uh, it depends on what camp you fall in. I enjoyed it, uh, but we're, uh, I'm, I'm so excited for this series, Hero. Um, and it, it may seem a little bit cheesy, may seem a little bit cliche, but if, if you know me at all, um, that's kind of part of my personality. I enjoy the cheese a little bit. Uh, and so, I, but I'm really excited for what God is going to speak to us through this, um, especially today, Palm Sunday, as we're preparing um, and approaching Easter. Um, so if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you, turn to Luke chapter 19. Uh, and as you turn there, before we get started, I just want to uh, take a moment to celebrate a few things, uh, Family Church. Uh, one of them is the Heart for the House offering that we took up last week. Um, your faithfulness, your generosity um, was was so evident and so clear through that. We took up a little bit over $10,000 in our Heart for the House offering. So thank you, thank you so much. We believe that God is still calling calling us to prepare uh, for now, but also for what he has in store for us. And so we're going to be doing some of those things. We'll keep you updated on the timeline of the projects we talked about. We're going to be getting some, some new equipment to help our online services um, and our service production team as well as some of the construction we talked about in security features for our kids area. So thank you so much, Family Church, for your generosity. I can't say thank you enough. God is moving and I'm so excited uh, to be a part of this church family. Um, also, we've had some amazing, <clears throat> excuse me, opportunities to serve over the last few weeks in new ways as we're finding. Uh, we've been able, you've been contributing to, to funds as well to, to be able to serve people. We've been able to provide some groceries to some families in need. Um, I've also seen some of our church members um, serving their neighborhoods, going out to their neighbors and just leaving um, literature on their door saying, hey, if you need anything, this is where we live and just being a blessing. I think I saw one family bring in uh, like movie night in a popcorn bin with red box code and, and snacks and stuff like that to people in their neighborhood. Uh, it's just such a cool thing uh, to, to be able to see and be a part of and, and be a part of this family. And just getting creative with how we're serving our neighbors and, and our community in this time. Um, and I want to let you know, if you think of any ways or hear of any needs, please contact us. We're more than happy. Uh, we want to help serve our community together. Um, but I love seeing that Family Church, you're taking the initiative and be in the hands and feet of Jesus. Just such an amazing, amazing thing, uh, especially as we're looking um, into this series called Hero. Uh, and we, you know, th that term hero gets kind of thrown out a lot. Um, but when you look at the heart of what a hero is, you need to look no further than Jesus to see what a true hero is. Um, and in our uh, scripture that we're going to use today, um, as it's Palm Sunday, we're going to talk about the triumphant entry into Jerusalem uh, that Jesus had. It's so exciting and such a cool thing. Uh, to read about. So uh, in your Bibles, on, in Luke chapter 19, we're going to read verses 28 uh, through 40 together. I'm reading out of the NLT. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, uh, follow along with me. Starting in verse 28, it says this, after telling this story, Jesus was a storyteller, one of the reasons to, to love him and learn from him. Um, after telling this story, it says, Jesus went on toward Jerusalem, walking ahead of his disciples. As he came to the towns of Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them. As you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, why are you untying that colt? Just say, the Lord needs it. Who can argue with that, right? Verse, tw verse 32 says, So they went and found the colt, just as Jesus had said. And sure enough, as they were untying it, the owners asked them, Why are you untying that colt? Verse 34, And the disciples simply replied, The Lord needs it. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to ride on. As he rode along, the crowd spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. When he reached the place where the road started down the mountain olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. 
peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Verse 39, but some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. And verse 40, he replied, Jesus replied, if they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. I want to share with you for just a few moments, Family Church, from um, a message and from a thought entitled, Keep the Stones Quiet. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for your word. Uh, We thank you for your spirit that leads us. Father, I pray in this moment as we receive the words you have for us and we receive instruction from your word, um, God, that you would speak to our hearts, speak to our minds. God, help us to be distraction-free and to focus in on what you're speaking to us today. Um, God, I pray you anoint my words, my thoughts to speak forth your truth, God, not my opinion. God, we love you, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I have a question for you. You can raise your hand in your living room. I'm going to choose to believe you're participating and you're raising your hands. You're going to say amen. You're going to say preach it. You're going to say, mm, that's good. But does anybody have like a favorite superhero at home or anything like that? Maybe, maybe it's not a superhero. Maybe it's just a hero, uh, a hero to you. It could be fictional or it could be real life. But when we hear that word superhero, obviously we think of the fictional characters and movies and books, but maybe there's a real life hero as well. Um, but as I was thinking about my uh, favorite heroes, my favorite superheroes, you know, sometimes my mind immediately goes to like something like the Avengers Uh, Something like, you know, a superhero that was born into being a superhero or made into being a super, you know, all these different fictional characters that we're used to. But the more I started to think about it, um, I started to think about myself as a middle school kid. Um, and I want you to, for, for just a moment, if you can, if you're in middle school, perfect. You're, you, you beat the rest of us to the punch. But if you're not, try to think back to when you were in middle school. Try to, try to imagine um, you know, your, your friends, uh, the school that you were a part of, whatever that looked like, and try to think back to what it was like being a middle schooler and who your heroes were then. Um, some of them, and maybe most of them are fictional. Uh, maybe as we've grown up, we've seen the true meaning of a hero, but uh, trying to get in the context in the mind of when you were back in middle school and who your heroes were. My mind almost automatically went to wrestling. Um, like the, uh, the, the choreographed wrestling, wrestling entertainment, WWF wrestling, because when I was in middle school, I was a huge, huge fan of that kind of wrestling. And the ones, like the characters that I took to in that kind of wrestling was always the ones that were playing the part of the hero, right? The, the good guys. Uh, th- those are the ones I always took to. They made it easy, right, to cheer for them because they always put them um, in the good position, saving the day, different things like that. And uh, as I continued to watch, I would, I would kind of observe things um, about these characters that, I, that were heroes to me, at least of the sport. I kind of observed some things about them and it, and it helped me kind of anticipate what their behavior was going to be like, right? When you observe something, it can give you insight uh, into what that person is or, or maybe what they would do. Like, oh no, that's out of character for them. And so I remember doing that with wrestlers and I remember it would always shake me to my core completely when they would take a hero of mine and turn him into a bad guy. It would, it would just, <clears throat> it, it, as a middle school me, it just ruined me. I'm like, no, <laughs> you're supposed to be the good guy. Why are you betraying me? Why are you breaking my heart? And it would just kind of unravel me. And as, as I was thinking about like the heroes I had growing up, even beyond that, somehow, I, I, I realized that somehow they would always let me down. Uh, the, the heroes that I had growing up, they, somehow they would always let me down. And I mean, the great news is that we do have a very real hero. His name is Jesus. And and the great thing about it is he's never going to let us down because he's the same. Scripture said he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we have a very real hero who's never going to let us down. And he's never going to turn into a bad guy at WrestleMania and break your heart either. Sorry, I'm over it. I'm just, it's still when I think back, it's hard for me. But the truth of the matter is, is heroes, as we think about them, have a tendency to let us down the more we get to know them or the more we know about them. Why? Because they're all human. Um, And and human beings have a way of of letting us down. We're human. We've probably let people down. But the great thing about the true hero that we have in Jesus is he doesn't change and he's not going to let us down. And what's amazing is there's some things that we can observe about our hero in Jesus 
especially because he doesn't change. And those things can give us real true insight uh, into a story from Scripture that maybe most of us are familiar with, right? We, maybe we read this every Sunday before Easter on Palm Sunday, so we're familiar with the passage. But when we observe some things about Jesus in this passage, it can give us real insight uh, into who he is and provide some insight for us. So I just want to talk about four things about Jesus' triumphant entry here that we can observe about him that can give us uh, some insight into this scripture that uh, maybe we're familiar with. Uh, The first observation that we have is that it was calculated. Jesus' entry was calculated. Heroes have a plan. And and Jesus here had a plan. It didn't just play out the way it played out. It was planned out that way by Jesus. You know, that phrase where he told his disciples, hey, go to this town and get this donkey. And when they say, hey, why are you getting that donkey? Just tell them the Lord needs it. That phrase right there, the Lord needs it. That was, Jesus didn't tell his disciples to say that, hoping that that would work. He told them that knowing it would work. Why? Because Jesus had a plan. He knew what this entry was going to look like. So it wasn't a plea. It was more like a password. It wasn't a plea like, oh man, I hope, I hope that by saying this, they'll let us take this donkey. It was more like a password because Jesus knew the plan. Um, there's this restaurant in town. Um, <clears throat> it's called Vernon's Speakeasy. And when I hear the term speakeasy, I don't know, like my whole posture changes like, hey speak easy. I, I don't know. That's probably why I'm not allowed in those places. Um, but I've never been there and I've always wanted to go there. I've heard from friends and stuff that have been there is, you know, you make the reservation, you make the plans to go there. They send you a password. And when you get there, you give them the password that lets you in according to the plan that you made. And so you don't show up. I mean, maybe I could try and show up and knock on the door and try to guess the password and be like, mm, is it blueberry pancakes? I hope it's blueberry. Okay, no, that's not the password. <laughs> but you know the password because of the plan that was made. Uh, when we see this triumphant entry into Jerusalem and we see this first step in the plan, Jesus knew the plan. It was calculated. Um, it, again, the scripture says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. He's all-knowing. So it wasn't some, well, we'll see how it plays out. Jesus had a plan for his entry, and Jesus knew what he was doing. Uh, The second observation we can make uh, is that it was courageous. Yes, it was calculated. He knew what he was doing, but it was courageous what he was doing. There was a price on Jesus's head as he was going back into Jerusalem. Uh, John chapter 11, verse 57, this is before his entry into Jerusalem. It says this, Meanwhile, the leading priests and Pharisees had publicly ordered that anyone seeing Jesus must report it immediately so that they could arrest him. Jesus was a marked man in Jerusalem and he still showed up. Like, he still came. He didn't sneak in the side either. He didn't sneak around the back. He showed up at the front door at a place where there was a price on his head. That's like, that right there is the stuff that heroes are made of. I mean, every action movie that you've ever seen is based on a plot that Jesus originated here. (laughs) There was a price on his head. People were after him. He knew he was going to be sought after and he still showed up. Why? Because Jesus was courageous. He displayed ultimate courage by showing back up and walking back into Jerusalem. I tried to like be a fly on the wall and and seeing this scene of, you know, going into a place where you know you're wanted, you know you're going to be persecuted. And he showed up. I'm still here. I'm still showing up. It's the stuff that heroes are made of. Jesus showed great courage. The third observation we can see is that it was calculated, right? It was courageous, but thirdly, it was kingly. It was a kingly entrance. And this, just by showing up the way he showed up, on a donkey, with the palm branches, people throwing stuff on the floor so it was a king's entrance into the place. This was Jesus' claim to be king. He had been saying it. He'd said it before. But his words weren't settling with people. Um, And so he was claiming to be king, not just with his words anymore, but with his action. See, people weren't really taking his words. Everybody wasn't really taking his words all that well when he claimed to be king. And so when his words didn't suffice, his action was nice. It 
was, you can keep that too. You can take that if you want to. When his words didn't suffice, his action was nice. He showed up and he made this claim, I am the king. Because heroes, they don't just talk, they walk. Or in this case, they ride in on a donkey. But you get what I'm saying. Heroes don't just talk, but they walk. I remember a time, um, again, once I got on this middle school train, all these uh, good and bad and in-between memories started popping up. But I remember when I was in middle school one time, um, and I was playing basketball in the gym before school started. And I was, I was in eighth grade, and a sixth grader came up um, wanting to play basketball with, with me and some of my friends. Um, and, uh, you know, again, when you're in middle school, eighth grader, sixth grader, and they're coming up wanting to play with us, I was like, sure, to your funeral, <laughs> let's go, give me the ball, I'll, I'll, I'll take it up top, let's go. And so I, was, I had all this confidence in the world, but he said he could play, because that's always the first question we asked when someone wanted to play, like, well, I mean, can you play if we hadn't been able to see him? And he said he could play, but because of what I saw, I didn't believe what he said. And as it turned out, it was actually to my funeral, because the kid just destroyed me and my friends, and we all left embarrassed <laughs> because we didn't believe what he said because of what we saw. I didn't believe his words, but he walked the walk, and then I soon started believing his actions. So Jesus' entry into Jerusalem at this moment was his claim to be king. It was him putting action to what he had been telling people. Because it, as you study into scripture, that was a king's entrance. Not just anybody rode in on a donkey like that. And a lot of scholars believe that the more you look into the text from each of the gospels, is that he didn't mount the donkey himself. His disciples placed him up on it. it. Just more speaking to the fact of a king's entrance. They laid things on the floor. They had palm branches. They were shouting and cheering for him. This wasn't just like you're walking normally into a city. This was a king's entrance that Jesus had been saying, but now he was putting action to it because Jesus walked the walk. And the fourth observation that we can make, it was, right, it was calculated, it was courageous, it was kingly, uh, but it was kind. And, and that's maybe something that we don't uh, give credence to when we're reading the scripture, but it was a kind act of him entering into Jerusalem like this. Because what it was is it was a final, um, a final appeal to accept Jesus as king on this side of the cross. For people that had been rejecting him, even the Pharisees that had been rejecting him, it was a final plea, him entering in this way, like, hey, guys, I am who I say, I, I, I am who I've been saying I am. And this is the final opportunity on this side of the cross to accept me as the king that I've been saying. This was a plea for that, or, or an appeal for that, rather. And Jesus knew what was ahead for himself, and he still made an appeal for people to accept him. Imagine that. Even though he was approaching human disdain, he was confronting people in love's name. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't trying to combat back. He wasn't trying to fight fire with fire. People were still going to have this hate, but he was responding in love. He was still responding with the kindness of who he is to get people to try to realize that he is who he's been saying he is, and he is who his father says he is. I mean, it sure would have been easy to mail it in, right, and simply focus on the pain that was awaiting him. I mean, this was on, right, this was on the week leading up to the cross, and Jesus knew what was awaiting him. So he could have very easily bypassed this kindness, this compassionate act, and just kind of said, all right, we're getting closer. No, guys, no, no I got I to gotta prepare myself for what's about to happen. Yet he still acted in kindness. Because here's the thing, heroes aren't just brute, right? They're not what we talked about, like him showing up knowing he was a marked man. He's like, yeah, I'm still here. Heroes aren't just brute. They're also compassion. They're also compassionate. Uh, there's a, uh, <clears throat> a video that I saw this week on Facebook uh, from one of our church members. His name's DJ. If you've ever met DJ, you know, you get a picture in your head already. If you've never met DJ, let me explain it to you. He's basically the rock. He is yoked. He's a big guy. Um, and he, you would look at him and know like, mm, okay, uh, maybe I will not mess with him today. Uh, but I saw this video on Facebook earlier this week. He has a young son, and they were dancing together in their uh, living room to Michael Jackson. Um, and like DJ was being so patient and so calm and so like, hey, no, this is, like, try this move. He, and it was just so cool to see this picture, right, of this big, strong man having a moment of compassion and sweetness and tenderness with his son. 
Because here's the thing, heroes, they aren't just brute, they're compassion. And so Jesus um, wasn't just acting on the, on the brute side of hero, he was acting in kindness, he was acting in compassion. Why? Because that's his heart. Scripture says it's the kindness of God that turns people toward him. It, it's, not, it's not the bruteness, it's, it's the kindness of God that turns people towards him. And Jesus has a heart of compassion. So his entry, the, these things that we can observe, it was calculated. Jesus had a plan. He wasn't chancing anything. It was courageous. He showed up knowing he was a marked man. It was kingly. It was to reiterate with action now, guys, I am my father's son. I am the Messiah. I am king. And it was a kind act to give people an opportunity again to accept him as king on this side of the cross. Um, and on the other side of this passage, where I really want to get into kind of the meat of what today is, um, the other side of this passage um, is the response of those around Jesus, right? Because we see this entrance. We see this, wow, here, here he comes. And just like any human being, when something happens, there's some sort of response in us. Um, maybe it's passive, uh, maybe it's proactive, maybe it's, it's reserved, maybe it's out front, um, but there's always a response in us anytime something happens. And when you talk about the entrance of Jesus, the triumphant entrance of Jesus, there is a response to those around him. Uh, we've observed some things, but let's take a look at three, response, three responses we see to Jesus' triumphant entry. Uh, basically, and, and another name for his triumphant entry would be his claim to be king. And so I want to work it backwards from the, the end of this passage first. Uh, and first we see the response of the Pharisees. So the first response we see is, is they listened for the stones. They listened for the stones. Now track with me. I promise I'm going somewhere. This, take notes and it'll all come together. Um, the first response we see from the Pharisees is that they listened for the stones. Um, they basically objected. They were in opposition to what Jesus was saying. Verse 39, we see, it said, some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, teacher, rebuke your followers for saying what they're saying. They're saying you're king. They're saying you're the Messiah. They're saying you rebuke them for saying. They were in opposition. They were listening for the stones, in essence. In their objection, the Pharisees were listening for the stones. In other words, they weren't in agreement with Jesus. So no praise came out of their mouths. No praise. Remember the last verse, Jesus said, if they don't praise, don't worry, the stones will praise. And so there was no praise coming out of the Pharisees' mouth. So they were kind of listening for the, they were listening for the stones. Well, are the stones going to, that's where the posture of their heart was. And what's interesting <clears throat> is that silence can sometimes communicate much louder than sound can. Silence can communicate much louder than words can. Uh, we were on a Zoom call as a staff um, the other day, as you know, all of our meetings have been over Zoom. <laughs> and so uh, we were on a Zoom call the other day, and we were just talking about a bunch of different things. And uh, you know, there was this point. You know, it's it's hard to connect virtually like it is physically. So I think there's this tendency to just kind of. Uh, you know, listen and wait to be prompted to speak. And so we were talking about some different ideas and there was kind of a lull of silence there for a moment uh, in our staff meeting. Uh, and in the lull, I just kind of told them, I said, okay, I'm going to take your silence as absolute disagreement. Uh, and they, everybody kind of chuckled, <laughs> which, right, it was because it was, it was kind of funny. Uh, but it was, it was actually a very, a real thing because I believe, um, and I believe right here we see some scriptural precedence for it as well, that silence sometimes can speak much louder than our sound can. And so rather than choosing to be quiet in a moment where something is demanded, some sort of response, some sort of praise, as we're going to see here, um, we, we can't just be silent and internalize everything. Sometimes there's praise that's demanded. And so the Pharisees here, what they were doing is they were, in essence, they were listening for the stones. Jesus says, if they don't praise me, the stones will praise me. And so the Pharisees, no praise was in their mouth, so they were listening for the stones. Silence can sometimes be toxic. Um, silence can do more damage uh, than it can. Now, there's wisdom in shutting your mouth in moments where you don't need to be opening your mouth, <laughs> but that's not the context of what we're talking about here. Uh, we're talking about the Pharisees' response was objection, and in essence, they were listening for the stones. Uh, the second response we see um, was to shush the stones. 
shush the stones. Uh, and this was the response from the crowd, right? The response from the crowd is we see this adoration. Uh, verses, in verse 36, it says, As he rode along, the crowd spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven. You see, the crowds, the followers here, as they're referred to here, the crowd, they can be tough to get a beat on, right, in in terms of their response. Because here, they're praising and they're cheering for Jesus as he's riding in triumph. It's easy to praise Jesus when he's so visibly and tangibly riding in triumph. I mean, this was his triumphant entry. And so they were praising him. They were cheering him on as he was triumphantly entering back into Jerusalem. But they wouldn't be doing that a few days from there. Uh, In fact, uh, some of that crowd would be the ones demanding and calling for him to be crucified. And, And how quickly could it change around in those few days? Why does that happen? One day they're cheering for him as he's triumphantly entering. And the next day they're chanting against him for him to be crucified. They are, in essence, shushing the stones. What I mean by that is, if you can get that, that picture in your head of Jesus' words, if they don't praise me, the stones will praise me. As the stones start to praise, they can shush them because things are going well. So, oh yeah, we'll praise. But maybe when things aren't going so well, the stones start to pipe up because Jesus said, if they don't, the stones will. So you can imagine the stones starting to pipe up, but when things go well, oh, shush, shush, no, 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 we're back. Yeah, Jesus, yeah, you're coming. Woo, things are tough. Okay, okay, well, we'll see, we'll see. And then the stones start to pipe. And so this is kind of a response that, that shushes the stones, so to speak. In other words, depending on the circumstances, depending on the circumstances, the crowd was cheering him on. The, the, the crowds were praising Uh, But things don't go well, and we see the crowds, not only do they maybe stop praising him, but the crowd, when we're in the crowd sometimes, it's not just that we stop praising him, then they start calling for him to be crucified because things looked so different. I guess you could call this type um, fair weather followers. Uh, The fair weather, you've heard of a fair weather sports fan before, right? These are, when things are going well, you'll hear me the loudest, Uh, but when things are taking a turn, I start to to quiet down. And I'm sure maybe you know some fair weather fans in your life. I'm not going to name any teams. I'm not going to name any people. You know who you are. You know who you are. <laughs> but these were basically kind of like fair weather followers of Jesus. When the triumphant entry was happening, they were cheering. But days later, they'd be chanting for him to be crucified. And the thing is, is the crowd here was doing the right thing at the time. I mean, it's not like the the correct response is Jesus is triumphantly entering. Okay, well, I'm going to be quiet then because I don't want to be a fair weather follower. I'm just going to be quiet. Oh, hey, cool. Jesus is here. No, this is, I want to be even keel the whole way. So I'm just not going to say, right? They were doing the right thing at this time because Jesus was triumphantly entering. Unfortunately, as we see, that just wouldn't carry over. And that wasn't the issue. The issue was this group of people were more becoming stone shushers. And then the third response that we see here to Jesus' triumphant entry was those that would keep the stones quiet. Keep the stones quiet. Uh, Verse 32, this was the disciples because their response was obedience. The disciples' response was obedience. In verse 32, as Jesus was preparing to enter, before it actually happened, um, that's when he told them, hey, go get the donkey. When When they just tell them, hey, the Lord needs it. So... Scripture says, so they went and found the colt, just as Jesus had said. I think that is maybe one of the most powerful verses in this passage. They went and found the colt, just as Jesus had said. Because that phrase, just as Jesus had said, implies two things. One, that the colt was in fact there. The donkey was exactly where Jesus said it was going to be. But secondly, the implication here is that the disciples did just what their savior, their teacher, their rabbi told them to do. They went and found the colt just as Jesus has said. And sure enough, as they were untying it, the owners asked them, why are you untying that colt? And the disciples simply replied, the Lord needs it. They said exactly what their savior told them to say. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to ride him, 
to ride on. And finally, we have the disciples, the ones who would keep the stones quiet with their words and with their actions. Now, before we go further, I know what you might be thinking, uh, but uh, Matt, Peter, hello, Peter kind of, he kind of, he, he dropped the ball once Jesus was on his way to being crucified. And he was like, wait a second, I don't know him. How could he be keeping the stones quiet? What, what are you talking about? Um, and the truth of the matter is, is you're right. Jesus or, or Peter did have that falling short moment. But we're not talking about never messing up or always responding in the right way. We're not talking about always having the right response because that would be perfection. And we're not perfect. We simply know the one who is perfect. So we're not talking about always responding in the right way and never missing it. What we're getting at here is that the relationship that you keep with Jesus, the relationship, because the response has a lot to do with the relationship. The relationship that the Pharisees had with Jesus uh, was not a close relationship and not a submitted relationship. The relationship the, the Pharisees had with Jesus was, we don't like this guy and what he's saying, so we're simply waiting for him to say something that we can use against him, and we're going to combat every way. So the relationship that they had with him had a lot to do with their response to his triumphant entry. They objected him. The crowd's relationship with Jesus had a lot to do with their response. The crowd, again, we talked kind of about, okay, when things are going well, we'll follow. We'll keep our distance though. We're going to follow. And so their response during a triumphant moment was, hey, we're going to cheer. We're going to cheer in his triumph. But the disciples, those that were closest to Jesus, those who obeyed him, had so much to do with their response here. Yes, Peter would go on and mess up, but then Peter would go on to be redeemed by the grace of God and be one of the leading voices in the church after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. So the relationship has a lot to do with the response. So yes, Peter messed up in that moment when he didn't respond like a disciple, but he recovered by the grace and the strength of Jesus. So these are the ones, the ones with that relationship with Jesus, those are the ones who would keep the stones quiet. Good, bad, easy, tough, anything else. The praise and the cheering and the posture of our hearts toward our Heavenly Father, toward our Savior, doesn't change. It's kind of like home field advantage in, in football. I don't know if you've ever you know, given any uh, credit to that or, or any thought to that, but like a home field advantage in football, it works well when people are doing what? When they're being the loudest. When people are cheering the loudest for who they're supporting, it works best for the opposition because it makes it harder for them to communicate. Cheering so loud for their teams that the opposition can't hear. Cheering so loud because they aren't going to wait for someone else to do it. And cheering so loud that the atmosphere shifts. Cheering so loud that something in the atmosphere changes and it becomes this electric atmosphere. Now, this isn't just a volume thing. I'm not just talking about whoever can cheer the loudest. This is simply an illustration. It's not just a volume thing. It's a victory thing. It's not just about volume. It's, it's, just about, it's not just about shouting as loud as you can all the time. It's about living in victory constantly, looking at the one who gave you that victory, the relationship, the posture of our heart toward our Heavenly Father. And then look again at the last verse in that scripture. In verse 40, verse 40 said, Jesus replied, if they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. Family church, I don't know about you, but I wanna keep the stones quiet. I don't wanna let the stones do what I can do. I don't wanna leave it to the stones to cheer uh, because I'm not cheering. I don't wanna let the stones praise just because I can't praise. And so I want to be in this relationship and in this area to respond in order to keep the stones quiet. Why? Because I want my mouth to be filled with the praises of my Savior. I want my mouth to be filled with the cheers of my Savior, with the support of my Savior. And as we, as we celebrate the triumphant entry of Jesus today and look forward to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus this week, Church, let's keep the stones quiet. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you so much, God, for sending your son, Jesus. God, we thank you for his life. We thank you for his birth. We thank you for his life. We thank you for his ministry, Father. God, we thank you that today we celebrate his entry back into Jerusalem. 
God, and we also celebrate what he was about to endure in the coming week, Father. God, I pray for all of us listening right now, God, that you would speak to us, empower us this morning to keep the stones quiet. God, fill our hearts, fill our minds, fill our mouth with the praises of Jesus. God, when it, when it seems hard to praise, when it seems difficult, when we're not in the mood, when we just don't understand what the point is, God, fill our hearts, fill our minds, fill our mouth with the praises of Jesus. God, I pray for everybody watching and everybody listening, that in this moment, their heart would be turned toward you, whether it's for the first time or whether it's simply a reigniting of turning our hearts towards you, Father. God, may you be glorified in all of it. God, I pray that there would be people out there now confessing your name for the first time, Father, that they're coming to faith in you, putting their trust in you for the first time. God, I pray that there would be prodigals coming home uh, right now, Father, people that have turned away but have now turned their hearts and their, their lives back towards you, God. And I pray for a fresh filling of your spirit and your people, Father, in, in your believers, Lord, to carry out and continue to live the life that you've called us to live. God, we love you so much. We praise you and we thank you for sending your son. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.